Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Uh, I am Rosa Cabrera, director of the Rafael Sintrón Ortiz Latino Cultural Center, uh, better known as the LCC. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, in this online series that we call Latinx Women Leaders Across Movements, uh, which we're presenting in partnership with the Women's Leadership and Resource Center to celebrate Women's History Month um, here at UIC and, and abroad. Uh, both cultural centers are part of the Center for Cultural Understanding and Social Change at UIC, uh, where we are a collective of seven cultural centers uh, committed to advancing positive uh, social change grounded in the principle of access, equity, uh, and social justice. Uh, and you can check out the work of the seven uh, cultural centers through the link um, that will be posted uh, in the chat uh, pretty soon. Uh, today's program is the last in a series of four online conversations uh, featuring four exceptional Latinx women leaders from the present, uh, centering their voices and experiences on a range of issues affecting Latinx communities, including labor and worker rights, immigrant rights, environmental and climate justice, and building transgender and queer Latinx power. Uh, these women are sharing with us what leadership looks like across intergenerational and intersectional movements and the action-based solutions and grassroots driven agendas that they are using um, demanding public policies to improve lives uh, in our communities. Uh, the conversations with these women leaders and activists uh, are sister centers, the uh, Women's Leadership and Resource and um, Resource Center, and all of you um, as participants uh, sharing virtual space have been energetic and very necessary as we continue to see uh, hateful acts of violence against women, in particular, women of color, black, indigenous, immigrant, disabled, queer, and trans women. Um, so having said this, I, I am now passing the mic to uh, Natalie Bennett, uh, the director of the Women's Leadership and Resource Center. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Greetings. Um, this has been a full day. So uh, first, let me say um, my name is Natalie Bennett, director of the Women's Leadership and Resource Center and the Campus Advocacy Network. Um, thanks to the Latina Cultural Center, to Rosa Cabrera, for inviting WLRC to collaborate on the Zona Abierta series. Uh, the series is also generously supported by uh, the UIC's Honors College, uh, which has helped us to do this really amazing set of programming. Uh, I hope this is this may be the final one in this series, but I certainly hope it's not the last that we'll ever uh, do either together or separately to really highlight what Latinx um, really badass women are doing uh, in Chicago and around the country. So as part of UIC's annual Women's Heritage Month, uh, we spotlight the political, creative, and intellectual work that happens at the intersections of feminisms and movements against white supremacy, uh, colonialism, homophobia and transphobia, imperialism, uh, state violence, carceral systems. Uh, in truth, this is actually what we do every day as a center where we create spaces to listen, learn, develop new language and tools to understand the ways that these systems uh, intertwine and how we can work together to dismantle them and lessen the harm that they cause. This is also WLRC's 30th anniversary year and today's program, uh, the conversation with Genesis Gutierrez uh, reflects our commitment to amplifying how women and gender non-conforming persons participate in and shape social justice movements that all of us benefit from and in order to build a more inclusive, just, and loving present and future. A part of WLRC's mission is also to foster collaboration and connection among UIC communities and with feminist and social justice groups in Chicago and beyond so that we can learn from and build with each other in order to address the larger issues, the structural issues that marginalize um, our people. Uh, finally, I want to say that, uh, Genesette, uh, you are now part of 
what we call the UIC heritage of uh, women leaders. And so we talk about heritage as what we inherit and what we pass on. And so your presence here uh, as part of this series, and I hope to continue beyond this, is part of what we are also offering back to the community, back to our students about what it takes and what it means to be and become and remain fierce women and gender nonconforming leaders, thinkers, organizers, and change makers in the city and the world. So welcome, Janice. Thank you, Natalie. Um, before I introduce the speaker, uh, really quickly, um, I believe that in a couple of uh, weeks, we will have all the um, uh, presentations, uh, the tapes available in the Latino Cultural Center website. So uh, make sure that you check back uh, with us at that point. Um, if you have not had a chance to um, be part of the other presentations, um, I really encourage you to check out those, uh, uh, those videos. Um, it is now with great honor um, that I'm introducing our guest speaker, um, Jenny Ser Gutierrez, pronounced she, her, ella, um, who is a, a transgender immigrant Latina from Tutspan, Jalisco. Uh, she's a national organizer with Familia, Transqueer Liberation Movement a national trans and queer Latinx and immigrant grassroots organization organizing at the intersection of trans and queer rights and migrant and racial justice. The organization's vision is to work at a national and local level to achieve the collective liberation of trans and queer Latinx folks by leading an intergenerational movement through grassroots organizing direct action and advocacy. Jenny said advocates for transgender rights and immigrant rights and prioritizes centering the voices of trans women of color in all racial justice work. Jenny said is determined to fight against all oppressive political and social institutions that stand in the way of the rights and dignity of all people. She currently resides in Phoenix. Welcome y bienvenida to our virtual community, Jenny said. Hi everyone, hola a todos, todas, todes. Un gran honor para mí ser parte de este evento. It's really an, a great honor for me to be part of this event and series. Um, my name is Janice Gutierrez. I'm a community national organizer of Familia Trans Queer Liberation Movement. And as we are closing, you know, Women's History Month, there's a lot happening. So I feel a little heavy. Um, it's, it's, you know, lots of things are happening in these last few days. We're facing with the case of George Floyd. Uh, we learned about the case of Victoria Salazar in Tulum, Quintana Roo, attacking immigrants from Central America. We're also, as we're closing Women's International Month, we are seeing a tremendous attack at the national level on trans youth, specifically trans women in sport, and it's unacceptable. Uh, it's really scary the territory our community is facing and you know more than ever we need to amplify the voices of not only the youth but our elders right that led the way and face so much in different era and um, at every level right in education at, in at, at in at work and any area where our community exists, which I'm pretty certain is everywhere. So I just wanted to take a brief moment to, you know, I just wanted to highlight that and, and acknowledge how heavy it, it, it has been for many of us, not just now, but for a long time before diving into my presentation. 
And I wanna make a, a brief presentation about my organizing and advocacy that I've been doing with Familia Transqueer Liberation Movement, and then we moved into the Q&A section. So happy to be here, really tremendous honor to the speakers that you brought. I saw Tania in Phoenix a week ago, she was here for a retreat with her organization. And you get to know that there are so many people to see the people on this, um, you know, uh, tune in on, on Zoom, on Facebook, know that Yes, we're facing an enemy out there, but we're also a community, right? Resisting, we have community fighting at every, at every attack that comes our way. So, um, so the, the work that I have done with Familia has been focusing on issues impacting specifically undocumented transgender women, more generally undocumented LGBTQ folks in detention centers across the country. Um, over the last uh, six years, we have been able to, at the very grassroots level, connect with local groups doing um, uh, organizing and advocacy and education around issues impacting a community that for a long time was in center, for a long time was ignored was thrown under the bus and, you know, Familia wanted to step up and say, we can't silence, we can't throw our people under the bus. And I'm grateful that I have found a home, a political home where it's really uh, through a, a political analysis, making connections with other struggles and, and saying we can't stand with white supremacists, we can't stand with, you know, racist, homophobic, transphobic individuals, especially those in power that are uh, hurting us. And, you know, these attacks that we are seeing recently are, are really, you know, it's sort of like, in some way, how uh, it, the lack of support, you know, now we're very visible, so no, I, I hope that no social group or social organization is trying to silence or, or no really pay attention to what's happening, right, with the community, uh, both in detention centers, in prisons, uh, uh, and now uh, uh, in education, right, where you're supposed to learn, you're supposed to uh, connect with your purpose and find, you know, find and fight for your dreams. I grew up in a generation with all those dreams, you know, were being crushed left to right. When I, you know, growing up in Mexico, I remember I wanted to um, put dresses on in, in elementary and I was rejected. I remember wanting to join the girls, you know, uh, music band and I was rejected. And this was before all this visibility with like attacks on legislation happening that makes it, you know, okay and it's 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 not okay right so now we have a big responsibility to really um support and stand behind our community and again the undocumented lgbt community has been a community that has been part of the struggle for years uh, undocumented lgbtq folks it's not like oh wow they're here with the caravans no it was way before that but uh, other groups were not paying attention so that work that we're doing has been uh, really uh, empowering. It has helped uh, undocumented trans women from Central America, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Mexico, to fight for the right to be in the US, for the right to exist unapologetically, whether they have documentation or not. You know, like that's not gonna hold back. When we are being persecuted in our home countries, we oftentimes are rejected by our family. So uh, for me to be able to, um, you know, have this opportunity, have this platform and the, the responsibility to travel across the country after being sort of in isolation while I was figuring out, you know, my gender identity, while I was trying to figure out what was gonna happen with my immigration status. So all of those things, um, not to say that issues weren't right, like at the center stage, but I was 
sort of in 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 a way uh, trying to find my voice and what roles um, do I want to you know contribute to the movement and um, through that advocacy we've been able to uplift campaigns uh, we supported campaigns uh, in other states and especially like in Arizona uh, there's uh, different uh, detention centers where our community existed. So local groups uh, here were uplifting cases. We supported them, took them to the you know, national level to mobilize our community. We launched complicated cases like Christina from undocumented trans woman from Peru who um, had criminal convictions, had medical conditions. So her case was very complex and it's it's one that challenge the narrative of the good versus bad, you know, that dominates the conversation. So with her case being so complex and difficult, we still wanted to send the message that Familia TQLM wants to really fight for all of us and not just tell some folks to wait, wait until things are in hostile. You know, there's no waiting for us because for us waiting literally could be life or death. So Christina Lopez, as we mobilized and we, uh, with her consent and the family, uh, were able to push for her case. You can find more info on hashtag free Christina. And, and um, you know, we also launched a case on uh, Valeria, another very complex, difficult case that at times, you know, torn the community. But the, the consistency on, on the direction of, of the difficult work for Familia was, you know, through taking cases and, and highlighting the values and principles that we are fighting for all of our communities, no matter how difficult the cases um, might be. And yes, going through that and um, making connections with what's happening to cases, right, of our community being dehumanized uh, by questioning their gender presentation and yes, going on what a document sh shows with the times we don't identify and can really make changes in our home countries. Here, it's, it's another way to navigate that. Sometimes it, it, it takes time and, and, and can really reflect our documents with our presentation. So, Yes, the, there's a lot of evidence already against ICE, right? Immigration Customs Enforcement of violations left and right. And this is an institution that it's not that very old and honestly, it shouldn't exist, right? So that's why the push to abolish ICE to hold people accountable and it's, it's a way that we have to continue to move forward. And as people started to mobilize and organize and saying our people are not safe and, and what what happened under the trump administration we saw two cases that started to get attention in a more national level for instance roxana hernandez undocumented trans woman from honduras she was only 33 and was seeking protection and uh, you know, living with HIV and what what she found instead was, you know, a brutal system that dehumanized her, penalized her, criminalized her, and eventually caused her death, right? So Roxana Hernandez died in ICE custody in May 25th of 2018. A year later, we found another case of uh, Joanna Medina, undocumented trans woman from El Salvador. She was in her mid 20s and similar circumstances as Roxana, right? Fleeing uh, the torture that they faced in their home countries um, and would turn herself in at the border. And uh, when she started to uh, demand medical you know, support, uh, because of Roxana's case and how the community mobilized, ICE made her sign her release. And I'm assuming they saw how ill she was and fragile, and they took her to the hospital, and then she was pronounced deaf, you know? So 
Um, they're not the first cases, unfortunately. Uh, another case less known is Victoria Arellano, uh, undocumented trans woman from Mexico, uh, died while she was at the hospital of complications of HIV. And she was handcuffed you know, to the hospital bed in, in the state that she was in. As, as fragile her body was, they still felt somehow she was a threat and that she was going to escape. Right? And, and what, instead what happened, she, she died in custody. So Victoria Arellano, Roxana Hernandez, and Joanna Medina are three, you know, difficult cases for us to have as a community, but also a reminder of the responsibilities that we have. Like if you're challenging immigration policies, if you're challenging detention, that you can no longer uh, ignore our voices or people who oftentimes are um, the ones who um, face the most, you know, horrific uh, um, attacks and destroying our humanity. And it's, it's very unacceptable and we need to, uh, and should be, you know, doing better. So that work has moved us into the current and pushed into ending, you know, trans detention in the US, specifically centering again the voices of undocumented trans women. Um, through that organizing, formerly detained undocumented trans women were able for the very first time have a meeting that took about a year to make it happen. And it was not an easy, even having that meeting wasn't easy on its own. It was a lot of pressure, it was an attorney, um, Flor Bermudez, who used to be at TLC at the time, was pushing and pushing to center undocumented trans women who were previously detained. And at that time, Mallorca was like the probably the second highest ranking of the, you know, the Department of Homeland Security and Immigration. So they he met with five uh, undocumented trans women in Washington D.C. at their headquarters. So that was the very first time. Uh, any detained people have been able to face and, and tell them in their face, right, in their faces, how what, the damage that they're causing to our communities and how responsible they are for that. So the entrance detention campaign, I think, has a potential. It can be a very uh, good uh, opportunity to end all detention for our people, right, and, and make sure that no one else gets ever detained and that we not only release people, but have a policy in place at the federal level where uh, our communities are, you know, labeled as vulnerable and that detention will not be the solution. And that's why it's important to at the same time support different direct services groups who have uh, been able to um, mobilized and, and some are newer, especially led by immigrant, uh, trans immigrant women who are providing the much needed support post detention. So all this has been, you know, happening over the last six years. And, and I wish I could go over to, to like a very specific timeline to show, right, the work that um, the Familia TQLM with the support of other local groups as leaders and have been able to, to mobilize and, and now build um, a base. So we need to continue to, to keep increasing our base. We wanna bring more people and also stand in solidarity with other groups who are under attack as we have seen, you know, with the Asian community, well, as we saw, um, after 9-11 with the Muslim community and when Trump took office, so he just went really fully open with, with the xenophobia and attacking uh, immigrants. So that brutality, it's not the way that we need to, um, you know, support in any way. So for, for Familia, for myself, I think it's a responsibility. And as we move forward, you know, how do we also challenge ourselves? Right, that we are uh, providing uh, the support that the community needs, uh, that we can um, develop programs that uh, 
make sure people are healing and, and really uh, continuing to fight for their dreams and the right to 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 be themselves in their full humanity. So it's been it's been difficult and and it has not been easy. There's been moments when I'm just trying to figure everything out, right? Like I'm all over the place. I'm like, am I making sense? Is this, you know? But sometimes we need to, um, you know, take a deep breath. Sometimes we have to slow it down. Sometimes we have to disconnect. Sometimes people have to do what they have to do, you know, to continue to move. And that's why I think the attacks that we are seeing now, especially with trans youth, is because of all the work like, if, for example, Marsha P. Johnson, Black trans woman, and Sylvia Rivera, you know, brand, excuse me, a, a trans Latina woman did in, in New York City. And all this visibility is now has taken us to politicians thinking that they know what's best for us and wanting to, to attack and you know, criminalize us through their uh, transphobic legislation. And if we allow that to happen before, there's no way we can let that happen anymore. And, and, and you know, now it's more than ever that in your uh, educational system because colleges aren't immune to transphobia, right? There's also the community who, who faces tremendous you know, transphobic attacks. If you look at uh, the bathroom issue, if you look at now sports. So again, the responsibility is from all of us. And, you know, if we get extremely tired, like that's why we have a movement, not just in the US, but globally, and how do we support other voices, other leaders, other organizations, and those who are behind us and, you know, facing these unfortunate and inhumane abuses. So those, that's sort of like a, a brief overview of the work that I've done with Amelia. And, um, you know, I just want to conclude this presentation and then we'll move into the QA with saying, when I grew up in Mexico, I always like looked at myself in TV with the, I connected with like the, the novelas, right? The soap operas, these very femme characters and actresses. And even before seeing them on TV, I was already at a very young age of three, uh, putting on dresses. Uh, my mom saw this behavior at a very young age. My sister saw this as well. And something, you know, I wanted to fully be me and I wasn't allowed, right? I was punished. First at home, then at the institutions that I was uh, being part of through so socialization. And then, you know, now we're moving into like the system. And I remember wanting to be a dancer, a choreographer. That was my dream. I used to love our tradition, so folklorico. And I wanted to like be part of it and put a dress on. And because I'm from Jalisco, you know, the traditional colorful dresses that is kind of resembles the rainbow flag, you know? And I wanted to put on a dress, but I was not allowed. And I just like, you know, I kept getting discouraged and, you know, like, that's not for you. And I never did I imagine that I was going to be like organizing, right? Especially at the national level and, and taking this um, responsibility. But now that I'm in this position, I want to continue to fight for my dreams, whatever they might be. I want to be able to save the lives so we don't have any more cases like Victoria, Roxana, and Joanna, and all our, our Black trans sisters and trans women of color who have been facing the ultimate sac you know, sacrifice of, uh, of violence and, and transphobia. It's unacceptable that we are seeing year after year at the list of our Black trans sisters growing and growing, you know, the trans women of color being brutally murdered. It's not, it's not about ending lives and, and killing us. It's about uh, helping us fight for our dreams and to fulfill, um, you know, every desire we have is like everyone else, you know? 
So I continue to organize and and find my more specific role in the movement. Again, it's full of gratitude for this opportunity to be part of this series with amazing, powerful voices who you brought before today's event, everyone behind the scenes organizing and making sure that you also bring in you know, other voices that oftentimes aren't part of the larger conversation. So um, I'm happy to um, answer any questions the remaining of the time. I'm happy to add some more context in something that I talked about and you are curious about. But again, my determination for a, a better world keeps growing and, and I will not let any elected official, I will not let a system tell me otherwise. So thank you. Thank you so much, Jenny Set, uh, for your presentation and for your dedication to building power among trans, queer, and gender non-conforming Latinxes and really for connecting to the continued heaviness that we're all feeling in this present moment with the George Floyd trial and the continued violent attacks across the country. Um, everyone, my name is Jorge and I am the Associate Director at the Latino Cultural Center. I use he and him pronouns. Uh, along with Ramona from the Women's Leadership and Resource Center, we will help moderate the community conversation portion um, so that we can make best use of time as we engage with Jenny Set. Uh, as a reminder, if you have any questions, please feel free to write your question directly into the chat. Or if you'd like to ask your question out loud by unmuting yourself, please write your name in the chat and we will call on you so that we can track the order of comments and questions submitted. Um, Jenny said we received a quick message saying that the captioner was having some trouble hearing you. So um, if you could um, you maybe speak up or perhaps hold your mic closer to you, that would be helpful to our captioner. Um, Ramona, would you like to say hello and get us started? Absolutely. Thank you, Jorge. Thank you, Jenny Setz. Um, again, my name is Ramona Gupta. I use she, her, hers pronouns, and I am the Associate Director at UIC's Women's Leadership and Resource Center. Jenny Seth, we are so happy to have you here with us, and we have so many questions for you about our work. And of course, we're getting questions from uh, the folks who've joined us here today. Um, I wanted to start with something that you've likely been asked about a lot, um, but I personally would love to hear from you about it if you wouldn't mind. Um, so the way that I first learned about you and the way that I imagine many people first learned about you um, was after an action that you took mm -hmm. at the Obama White House. Um, that was an event that was purportedly in celebration of our trans communities. Um, and you were a lone voice in that crowd. Um, as far as people who aren't there could tell, um, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and uh, challenging the federal administration about its anti-trans policies uh, and practices. And I just wanted to know if you could talk a little bit about that experience and what it was like for you in that moment and in the days and the weeks that followed. Um, certainly from an outsider's perspective, it seemed as though you did not get a lot of support from a lot of the people that were there at that event um, and possibly afterward. And so, um, yeah, if you wouldn't mind talking about that, I think that'd be helpful for, for folks to hear about. Thanks. Yes. Thank you so much for that. And uh, the White House direct action was probably one of the most challenging things I've done in my life. And again, as I talked about my journey briefly, how I wanted at a very young age already expressing my gender, wanting to be associated with femininity, and I was just being pushed back and told no, no, no. And then coming to the US as an undocumented person and having my sister, you know, petition and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for so many years to change my immigration status. So all those things, right? I remember I used to always wanted to speak up and be very involved, but I was being as I was being pretty much what if you've seen the video, people were trying to do that moment, silence me, you know, and and um, when we, uh, when I fully transitioned, it was September 2000, 
um, 13 during, um, it was, uh, I think, the uh, Labor Day weekend when I decided to be myself. And I was living in LA after doors were being closed because of my immigration status and really, um, you know, relying on alcohol and other things to release some of the pain that I was struggling with right internally as far as not being myself. So all those things connected me to organizing. And, uh, and I was just like, at this point, I'm, I'm ready to be detained. I'm ready to be deported. I just can't stay quiet, you know? So when, when they reached to me about uh, doing the action and they let Jenny say, you know, um, we have a plus one ticket to go to the White House, but we want you to do a direct action. And immediately I was like, yes, you know, without hesitation. But as I continued to process more of it, I was like, oh my God, you know, then my humanity kicked in, right? All these insecurities, like, oh my God, am I going to do it? And I remember calling my family and especially my mom, she's like, oh my God, we're so proud of you. And, you know, tell President Obama at the time that we, we say hi and things like that, you know? So the, the action was going to be myself, uh, a, a trans immigrant woman from El Salvador, who was also an activist and uh, came to the U.S. seeking asylum and was in D.C. Uh, her case was approved like a week before the action. So and then was going to we were going to have a black um, trans immigrant woman being part of the action. So it was going to be three of us. Right. And as I was giving this information, I was thinking, like, how do we how do we join our voices? Like, who can start this? And then how do we all come together with the bigger demand of the no one more uh, campaign at the time that was fighting for the you know deportations under the Obama administration? But for some reason, you know, uh, because of the complexity and I, I guess the challenge, at the end, they didn't come through. So when I was at this reception and it was about, right, like a, a leader of the world bringing community, bringing organizations who are uh, doing work nationally to move uh, the rights forward for our community. Also like, you know, knowing that the Obama administration has probably the highest number of deportations, over 3 million people, the conditions that folks were facing in detention, especially trans immigrant women, like the people that were behind this action knew about Victoria Arellano. Uh, we've heard and met multiple uh, trans immigrant women from Central America who talked and testified over and over, right, at different levels of the abuses. So when all the community there sharing, you know, a leader and saying how wonderful thing is because marriage equality is about to be uh, a big, you know, U.S. Supreme Court decision, which happened two days after the action. So I just wanted to, to you know, raise my voice and 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 yes, challenge, right? Challenge an administration of the conditions on the deportations. And, and the inhumane treatment. Um, I had the support of um, Isa Najola, an amazing trans Latina activist who was you know, mobilizing uh, an attorney in case I, I got arrested. Um, I had like few people because I was in some way new to the movement. I didn't really know a lot of the people there. I didn't have a lot of time to think about post action. So I was just like, you know, just going with my intuition, you know, and and um, acknowledging how hard it was, right? And how unprepared I was to face the consequences. I knew that um, I couldn't sleep the night before. I, I remember getting up in the middle of the night, looking at myself in the mirror, like, am I gonna be able to do this? Um, you know, like invoking the names of Sylvia and Marsha P. Johnson and like, how do you face all these, you know, things in the 60s and 70s and things like that. So, um, 
when everything happened and the the, the attention the attention attention and the backlash like none of that was really part of my thinking part of my planning and um we just knew we had to face it with all our uh, dignity and humanity not just for me but for the community who was you know um has been saying how bad it's been and that was not like a moment that holds us back or push the organization that we continue to mobilize, we continue to um, have different gatherings, again, centering on documented trans women, uh, mobilizing our folks, taking cases, and, and just to know that the community is stepping up. And now we are seeing more organizing around this issue, that there's more support and immigration judges listening openly, right, and about their complexity of their cases and and hoping that it's it's easier for our um, community to to seek asylum so it was just like you know i i remember being interviewed and people were being like were you drunk and i was like you know the white house has cameras in every corner looked at the videos if they lay you and i only had one bottle of champagne that i wanted to like calm me down because i was wasn't sure, you know, if I was going to get through, and I was extremely nervous. And the only only person that did join specifically trusted me from the very beginning. You know, Angela Peoples was part of the action. She's the one who took the alternative video uh, that is on YouTube. She's the one that you know from the very beginning until the end. Do what you need to do. Just let me know at what point do I join. You know. The action and and also when I start, you know, saying no one more deportation. So yeah, so as I continue, you know, like um, I remember in the preparation, I was told that it was going to be one minute. So when I'm, you know, challenging the president, and and a minute went by, and I was like, oh my god, what do I say now? What's gonna, you know, at what time am I getting kicked out? You know, so I was just like um, holding, holding. The best I could, uh, and I think my spirit was being held, you know, by my ancestors, and and I think that's what held me together from the beginning. I raised my voice until like I kicked out of the house. As soon as I was being escorted out, I think it's when I felt the most intensity and continued to scream, not just as the, a leader of, uh, you know, of, of the time, but also my own community. Like, how dare you? be you know turning your back on on this issue like what's there to laugh about when people are being murdered you know what is there to to celebrate you know when our people are sleeping on the streets when our people don't have food to eat so what is the celebration that you're laughing so loudly and proudly about that is not what pride is about you know so I have so much more to share and it could be a whole different conversation, but just to say that it wasn't easy and it will never be easy, you know? So now as I continue to process and, and, and challenge myself and, and seek the support that the community needs, I know that it was the right decision at the right time. And now it can no hold us back. Jenny said, thank you so much. Um, I'm feeling really emotional um, hearing you talk about it. And um, I just want to say that, you know, I can imagine how lonely it must have felt um, in that moment and in, in within the backlash that you had received. Um, but I also know that I am among many people who really um, just were in awe of your bravery. Um, and your choice to use your voice and your your presence, um, your place in that moment, um, in that way, and um, yeah, it, to this day, it's it's so meaningful. And and I share that hope with you that you know that times have changed since then, mm -hmm. and that people understand that these issues are all inextricably linked, mm -hmm. right? And that it is absolutely important to talk about what is happening with our immigration system at an event that is also specifically supposed to be about trans lives and trans experiences. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you again. Um, and I think Jorge has a question for you from one of our audience members. 
Thank you, Ramona. Um, we have a couple comments and questions that have been submitted. Um, I'll read one of the comments. Um, we have Hinda who wrote, having studied politics, it seems that transgender rights are being used for what is considered a wedge issue, a way for certain politicians and political parties to mobilize their base through demonization. Mexican immigrants and Black Lives Matter have also used as wedge issues as well. Um, and I'm not sure if you want to comment on that, Jenny said, before I ask you the next question. I think that's important to highlight because uh, what the system wants to do through this very heavy attacks, right, on Black lives, uh, on, on Black people, on immigrants' community, what they want to do and, and really push through taking that position is heavily, heavily criminalizing our existence, dehumanizing. Again, there is tremendous evidence since colonization started in this part of the world that they don't want to acknowledge, that they don't want to uh, realize the implications that is still having on our generation and, and things like that. So with that, I think what their purpose is to divide us to, to put us against each other and continue to let them freely enjoy all the benefits of that, that people are entitled to, you know? And as we look at the communities, like the immigrants communities, we also need to look at the indigenous communities, right? That were part of this continent way before white people came here. And gender was also, very, very expensive. It wasn't just the binary that they want to throw us in our faces. So don't let any, any politician that pushes so hard to the right to, 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 to um, you know, favor with them. Because going to the issue of trans youth and trans existence, when I was three years old, again, I already knew who I was. I, you know, wasn't asked to be given the name that I was given at birth. I wasn't asked to be assigned a specific gender when I was born. I didn't ask any of that. What I was, as I was growing and become conscious of my existence, I was already connecting with who I am, right? And it was through, through that fear of not understanding that my siblings started, to, they were making decisions thinking it was the best for me when it wasn't. You know, now years later, uh, on New Year's Day, I found I had this very difficult conversation What I learned that, you know, my mom and my sister put me through conversion therapy at eight years old, thinking that if I took medication, if I saw a therapist, that that was going to be, quote, normal, unquote, right, whatever that is. And, you know, my sister years later told me that in my face and apologize for the harms that she caused, you know, and by making the decision out of fear also that they didn't want me to be punished for, for being femme, that, that for my attraction and things like that. So I was actually in complete silence for a moment, you know, I didn't know how to respond to that revelation. I knew it was there, but it wasn't fully conscious. And as she said that, I think that was the piece that I was missing in my own healing journey to even go stronger, right? As we are facing these attacks, again, under a Democrat administration that has never done enough for us not to be in this place where we are, you know? So, you know, all these things and how even our, what role is our people playing in driving these wedge issues and making them stronger for mostly white politicians, right? Who are hetero or cis, uh, as, as, at least by what they want to project, but who knows what happens, you know, behind doors or things like that. So, um, I'm, again, it's just important to, to name to what it was. And instead, like in my, in my own case with my family, instead of really holding a lot of resentment or, or at attacking my sister and my mother, whom I have the blessing to have both, I just turn all that into, into compassion, you know, and love because 
Um, I know they're not the enemy and they will never be, but it is the system that wants to make it okay for us to live a life that we doesn't, it, it's not who we are and, and it, it wants us to please them and give them more power, right? Through exploiting our labor, it's exploiting to our humanity, but absolutely not. I just cannot tolerate that in the US or any part of the world. And I know I'm just one person, I know I'm one voice, but we are many. And that's the threat that they feel right now. And that's why being openly against, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, being openly against the trans youth uh, of the trans community, gender non-conforming community, being openly against, you know, through the previous administration, banning specific groups, especially of color, right? from from now coming into the U.S., so you know it's 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 not an easy way. It's, it's there's a lot of like nuances that happen, but I hope that with this conversation, especially cisgender folks, that they don't see trans people as a threat, that they don't see gender nonconforming as a threat of your existence of your humanity, because the the friendly face. Is what will slap you in the face and step on your neck so hard instead of people that you think are your enemy. Thank you so much for sharing that, Jenny said, and for really going into the harm and heaviness that you've experienced um, and how you've chose your healing journey and compassion and love. Um, we have a handful of questions, but we have someone by the name of Josue Ayala Flores who wanted to ask you their question directly. So Josue, go ahead. Hi, Jenny said. <laughs> I um, am so glad to see you today doing this talk. I actually developed a friendship with Jenny said when I was an undergraduate at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And I was involved in activism work at my while I was an undergrad. And I remember I came across her video on face. I think it was on Facebook. I used to use Facebook at the time. And I saw the full video, not the video that the media was putting out of like the short, you know, they were they were trying to sell the whole heckler situation. Like I watched the entire video where you see mostly white men, white cisgender men turning their back on, on Jenny Set and basically um, shutting her down. It brought um, the hairs on my arms raised. It really made the reality of understanding how uh, in the bigger LGBTQ mainstream moment or movement, uh, trans and queer people of color are always shut down. So I knew I had to bring her to campus. Uh, I wanted her to come and speak to our school and I've been able to develop a friendship with her now moving forward, and I feel really lucky. Um, and so I know that perhaps I haven't really thought if I've asked you this before, but I wanted to know in your moments where you felt like you've been going through the toughest battles internally, mm -hmm. um, at what moments did you feel like you wanted to give up and what resilience or what inside you helped you overcome those moments that you thought you wanted to just completely give up? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Josue, for that. And so good to see you. I also see RJ Robles, whom I both, you, I know you both and appreciate you both so much. So, um, yeah, I think there's multiple times in my journey when I wanted to completely not exist, right? Before transitioning, there were moments when I was pushing myself through the rejection that I was feeling through not having opportunities where I, at times, was thinking of suicide, right? Like, I think maybe the solution is to not exist and just take this pain away myself. Um, and, but when I, I was you know, able to, to start facing this pain and paying attention to it, it's when I started to somehow uh, find um, some sort of strength that I didn't have, I had, and and has kept me going through it. For me, my healing has been uh, being able to listen to that pain and and sort of dig deeper into why was I doing all these things? What was what is this so hard for me to be myself and and live my truth first with myself and then with the rest of the world, right? 
And I, like I used to think about when I was very depressed, how I look at myself in the mirror and and believed, right? This horrible attacks and dehumanization of just like maybe maybe I am nasty. Maybe I don't deserve opportunities. Maybe I, I'm less than, you know? And 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 when I realized that it wasn't that wasn't the case for me, that's when I started to really walk into my truth even more and deeper. There were moments where I in some way um, was letting my hair grow and thinking maybe if this is not who I am, let me cut my hair short, let me present a certain way. But the more I tried to run away from my 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 truth and power, the more I was like, you know, it was getting more complex for me personally. So that was one moment. Another time it's where, you know, where uh, I started to to do organizing and the action also took a toll on me, like how people were just being, um, you know, in critical, all the backlash um, and, and, you know, it was easier to just say, you know, I don't want to face any negativity I don't want to face dealing with all of this so I think the action was also another moment where I just wanted to 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 um yes say I'm done you know I'm done I don't I can't I don't have the energy I don't have the motivation to do anything else and then also some like challenges that I face personally challenges that we have faced as an organization who are very complex Right, who are for for some people like easy to just stop doing things, stop organizing, stop using your platform, stop, stop, stop. You know, but I think the harder part and the most difficult work is when you say no and continue to face and and keep going and keep pushing. So I think for me, all those times when I felt really, really down, and and um, you know having support now from my 84 year old mother, single mother, having support of my family, having support both blood and chosen, having a community out there, I think this is what keeps me going. And also understanding that it's not gonna be an easy process moving forward, that we're all dealing with so much mentally, physically, and spiritually. But I think if it's something that I've learned over the last few years is to not give up because we're not in this alone. Just connect your energy with folks that really do mean well and that will help you keep going and facing challenges as difficult as they might be. So thank you. Denisa, thank you so much. And thank you, thank you, Jose, for asking that, Jose, for asking that question. It's and thank you, Jenny Set, for answering with such authenticity and honesty, um, because the work that you're doing is not easy. Um, and, you know, we certainly, it's helpful to hear all of that. We certainly also want to celebrate you um, and all that you have done and all the, the work that you've done with, with your communities and with, um, with your organization. Um, and there's a lovely comment from Rosa um, that you radiate love calmness and reassurance. Um, and I, I think we all feel the same way. Um, we have a comment from our colleague, Jacob. Jenny said, you are amazing. Thank you so much for everything you have done and for who you are. Um, we're sorry that we don't have time to get to all of our questions. We had some more great questions um, from our own staff and from uh, our friends here in the comments, um, particularly about your organizing strategies and who you're organizing with across the country. Um, but we are out of time. And so we do want to say thank you again to Jenny Seth. Thank you to our partners for hosting this event today.